We need to finish part seven. Okay, it's not a very long part. We can do it. Okay, and then tomorrow I told you you'll be working with the Bunsen burner. So actually, though the um, the calculations we get to in today's lecture, you'll need for tomorrow's lab. Um, and then Friday, we're going to do the last part in Unit One. It's like, oh, there goes Unit One. I can't believe we're like we're like four weeks into the semester of 16. Congratulations, you're a quarter of the way done. Time for a unit exam, right? <laughs> <laughs> so then before your unit exam next Thursday, a week from tomorrow, we've got a couple of lecture days. And this is usually what happens to me this time of the semester. I'm going to forge ahead into the first part in unit two. So the thing about it is it all kind of schmoozes together anyway. You know, I break it up into units, but it's just chemistry. Okay, so that's kind of how that will go. So um, the way your unit exams are always during lab, which is kind of nice. Um, I kind of like that because it gives you guys, instead of 50 minutes, it gives you a full two hours. The exams were meant to be taken in 55, zero minutes, but you have the full two hours. Okay, yeah. So we have a lab this week. When's our lab write-up due? Your lab write-up will be For due when you come, will be due the, the day of the... Um, it'll be due Thursday or before I get to my office on Friday. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll think about it. I've done different things um, with the write-up that's due when you come take your test, and I might do this. I'm not saying so. So what I do sometimes is if you do the calculations and hand them in when you sit down and take your test, then you don't have to do the other stuff. Isn't that kind of sweet? That's awesome. I know. Okay, so we'll do that. But then if you don't, then you have to do the full semi-formal lab report. The good thing about doing that is it pulls you through those calculations in lab that hopefully will help you on the test. So, um, so you, you know, your semi-formal lab report has the three parts, you know, the summary, which actually has three parts, the calculations, and then you Xerox copy your, okay. So um, those, if you... Uh, get your lab write-up done when you come at 1 o'clock. So it has to be done by 1 o'clock. No 4 or 3.30s. If, if, if you're ready to hand something in at 1 o'clock, all you have to hand in is your calculations. No, I probably should. Yeah, that's what I... Yeah, no, you do because they have to go hand in. But that's easy. But no write-up. You have to have the last two sections. Yeah. And, but it has to be done neatly, you know, it's just the, the labeling and the factor label. You guys know when I put FL, that stands for factor label. That's what I was looking for. Okay. Um, so we'll do that, okay? And then, but some students are like, no, i got to study. And so then they go home and they knock it out and then they have to do all three parts, or actually just that first part, the summary part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Glad you asked. Okay. So tomorrow, the lab that's due requires you to do to use um, Lab Pro. Lab Pro? Is that what I want to say? Logger Pro. Logger Pro. Thank you. Logger Pro. Okay. So that's it. And you'll be using Logger Pro other times this semester. Okay. Okay. All right. And I just put this here. Actually, this is the one that you guys handed in. So. Now we're ready for something new. Maybe. Okay. So we talked about the concept of a mole. And I bet you guys learned this in your previous life in chemistry, that a mole is just a way to kind of say how much of something. It's an amount. It's the standard unit of amount. And one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. You think you got to memorize that? Yes. You will want to memorize that. So now that's the same for anything. If it's carbon atoms, if it's boron atoms, if it's silver atoms, if it's uranium atoms, that's the same relationship. If it's hockey pucks, you know. But now there's this other thing that's not the same for all elements. It's called the molar mass of that element, the molar mass. And the reason it's not the same is because basically atoms weigh different. Okay, we talked about the average atomic weight. The thing about how much an atom weighs is kind of nice because it does increase from left to right across the same, what we call period, down to the next row or period, left to right, next row period, okay? The weights do increase like that. 
So there's this thing called molar mass, and basically you get one mole of that substance together. So if you're a visual person, you get one mole, one mole of that, and you weigh it, and, and whatever grams, thank you, whatever grams it says, then that is your molar mass. So going back to a few slides, we had the first part of this. We had... Um, with regard to hockey pucks, now mole, the concept of a mole, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things, is usually reserved for atoms or molecules, something small. But we said with regard to hockey pucks, if you have a mole of hockey pucks, okay, and you were to weigh them, it would be equal to mass of the minute. That's like the molar mass of hockey pucks, Okay. So, but we're going to switch gears and talk about the elements for now, and then we're going to stretch that in unit two to molecules. But basically, you get one mole of, of um, one type of element together, one mole of atoms of one type of element together. Whatever mass it is, that's its, that's its molar mass, grams per one mole. And I'll go ahead and throw this up there. Sometimes, if you're kind of into the whole linear thing, um, Remember that anything that's raised to a negative power is in the denominator. If it's raised to the negative first like that, it's then the denominator raised to the first power. Okay, those are just two ways to write um, molar mass. So grams per mole. So here's the deal. For the elements, so since they get heavier from left to right, go down a row, left to right, down a row, left to right. Since they keep getting heavier, um, the the mass you need to set aside to get one mole of those atoms keeps getting heavier. The molar mass keeps increasing. And I'm here to tell you that the molar mass is numerically equivalent to the same, it's the same magnitude of the number as the average atomic weight that we talked about earlier. Remember the average atomic weight, the decimal number? Okay, that's also the molar mass for the element. And that's not by accident, and I could kind of show you a proof how that came about. But the decimal number serves for two things, and they're listed in bold up here. The decimal number is the average atomic weight. Remember, you guys did a handed in a homework where, in order to know what the average atomic weight is, you have to look at the different isotopes there are and how abundant each isotope is and how much each isotope weighs. That decimal number. So that's also the grams you need to set aside to get one mole of atoms of that type of element. It's the molar mass. Okay. All right, so here are some moles of stuff, okay? Adorable. That is copper. Yellow stuff is sulfur. So we've got a density. Well, density got an issue. I'm not sure. But um, these, have the diff these have the same number of atoms, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, okay? Then we have mercury. Everybody loves to play with liquid mercury, right? And then we have a balloon with helium. And some of you guys know all gases, like helium, if they're at standard temperature and pressure, that is 22.4 liters of volume. Okay. Anyway, but you see this? Have you guys heard about the helium shortage? So little kids everywhere are, like, freaked out. So there's like history behind this, and, the, and this article will tell you, this is like August of this year, um, that helium shortages have come and gone. And the thing about helium is it used to be, and I don't think it is now, the federal, it used to be part of a, a federal reserve process, okay, where thou shalt, the United States had a chunk of helium, okay, and you had to check it out. Not so much anymore. The thing about helium, too, is just like, you know, you let those balloons with helium go. You know, helium, once it's free in the atmosphere, there's nothing to stop it. It basically leaves the gravitational pull of the Earth, Earth itself. So it's out of here. So put another way, and you read this article, there are, I guess there are ways that our helium on Earth can be, um, you know, replenished, but it takes years and years and years and years for us to get more helium. Okay, so it's interesting. And the other thing about helium is, you know, if, you're, if you've seen those, like, cool liquid nitrogen experiments where they take um, nitrogen and, and cool it down and pressurize it and liquefy it and it's very cold, 
Okay, so that's liquid nitrogen. Well, um, since helium is even a smaller, it's a smaller atom, nitrogen is one of those diatomic elements, N2, right? Well, helium, to make it liquefy, is even colder. So my point here is it's great for cryogenics. And so anyway, just thought it was interesting. Helium shortage. So one mole of atoms of those different types of elements. That works. All right. So here are some beakers and a similar thing, a very similar thing. But here, what I'd like to do is take just a moment to go ahead, and if there's one mole of sulfur here, then for instance, and I just, I get my exercise, the decimal number for sulfur on this periodic table is 32.07. So there are 30, did I say that right? Good. 32.07 grams of sulfur there. Okay. Magnesium. Oh, that's my password. 24.31 grams. It's not my only password. I've gotten in the habit of using elements and their average atomic weights and their atomic numbers for my passwords. Tin, what's the symbol for tin? It's not TI. It's not AU, it's not AG, it's what? SN. It is SN. Ding, ding, ding. Very good. Tin is, it's one of the transition elements. Where'd you go, tin? No, it's not. It's a, a P block element. It's a whopping 118.71, 118.71 grams to get the same number of tin atoms. Silicon, uh, 28.09. And last but not least, copper, and we did that one the other day. The decimal number, again, is 63.55. Okay, so like for instance, if we pick on sulfur, we would say, but do you see where it varies by the element? Okay, so for sulfur, and it's like a physical property of this stuff. Picking on sulfur, we say that for sulfur, there's 32.07 grams in one mole. Did stop writing? Of sulfur. I think it, it got mad because I, I filled it. It was full, so I kind of got rid of some of it. I'm hoping it works better now. So it's a physical property of that element that varies. Why? Because the masses vary, um, and it's molar mass. Okay. So let your units do your heavy lifting when you work these problems. And always, always go with, because I'm going to be looking for it. This is what I call the factor label method. I'm always going to be looking for when you work problems, grams per mole. Sometimes, quite honestly, you're going to be using it moles per gram. It's a property. Use it as a tool. And I heard my colleagues say recently, which is, did I tell you that my husband teaches this at the West Burlington campus? Well, now you know. So my colleague and I were talking, and the thing is, is I should never see that divide by key. I should never see that divide by key when you're working calculations. And again, I refer you to just, just look ahead. Look in all physical sciences, and they don't do the little divide by key. They set it up as ratios. All right. So here we go. For calcium, now it makes a difference now. I've got to say what element we're dealing with. And this is, again, remember the brackets I told you the convention is, is that won't necessarily be part of the problem. So it'll probably read something like how many moles is <coughs> 0.487 grams of calcium. And you just know it's how many moles of calcium atoms are there in that mass of calcium. So this would be, um, and I don't have a slide to kind of kind of do this, but if we kind of map it down the bottom here, this would be a grams to moles problem. And remember how we kind of write over the arrow how we accomplish that? Do you see where I can use the molar mass of calcium? And I'm definitely going to have a periodic table when you take your test next Thursday. 40.08 grams per mole. Now notice I didn't say 40.08 grams calcium per one mole calcium. 
And that's because, in this case, I'm only dealing with calcium. So I'm cool with that. Later on, when you kind of have, or in the, some of the homework problems, you have more than one element. You have to be explicit. So it's not too bad. You see where I'm just going to put 0.487 grams over 1. And then my next term is going to be this flip. Does that make sense? Because I want the grams to cancel and be left with moles. So this slide kind of says the physical property of calcium, the molar mass of calcium, the decimal number for calcium from the periodic table. Okay. Notice what I can't use when I'm doing my calculations is this. And by the way, my abbreviation for molar mass is MM. Okay. I might write it like this. I guess I should, it's right up there. I might write it like that, 40.08 grams per mole. Okay, but I wouldn't use it in a calculation like that. All right, so we could also say the inverse is true. For calcium, it's a physical property of calcium. It wasn't until the last couple of years, though, and I've been teaching this for a while, I'm like, oh, that's a physical property of, of that particular element. In one mole, it would weigh 40.08 grams. And it's like we've been talking, um, the way this works is this is exact, the one is exact, okay? But there is uncertainty in that decimal number. Okay, so four, six, six. All right. One last but not least, we could say that we could actually set it up for an equality for calcium. 40.08 grams of calcium is equal to one mole of calcium atoms. So here we go. Put the number we want to convert. So this is a grams to moles problem. So the number we want to convert over one. And then I kind of mentioned, I already told you, we're basically going to take, I call the flipped version of the molar mass because we want grams to cancel. That's it. Sometimes, and I'll say we, not just you students, sometimes we make this so much harder than it really is. Okay? So, divide it out. How do we need to round it? Three. Three. Very good. Okay? Now this is a good example of, remember that that zero after the decimal is a placeholder. Can't remember which rule it was when we talked about significant figures that actually you need it there. Stopped writing, didn't you? You need it there, but um, it's not significant. That's it. Let's do another one. And if that was a grams to moles, now we need to do a moles to grams problem. <laughs> okay. Picking on a different element instead of calcium, picking on boron. So we're going to go to our uh, periodic table, look up the molar mass for boron. But if we were to go ahead and... Um, Go ahead and uh, write the strategy here. We would put moles, arrow, grams. And then over that arrow, we would put the molar mass of boron. <laughs> I have no idea. Moles, arrow, grams. Okay. And sometimes I put 1.33 moles to question mark grams. Okay. So the decimal number for boron is 10.81. So that means with regard to molar mass, there are 10.81 grams of boron atoms in one mole of boron atoms. And it's a property that we can use as we need to. The inverse would be fine, too, for boron. One mole of boron atoms would weigh 10.81 grams. 10.81 grams of boron is equal to one more mole of boron atoms. Okay, those are all great for boron. So what's our first term going to be? 1.33. Yep, 1.33 moles over 1. Thank you. So are we going to use the regular version of the molar mass or the flipped version of the molar mass? The regular version. Yep. And that's it.
Okay. So as long as you can remember to kind of keep your wits about you and, and pull off the periodic table, something that can be used in this problem, you're in good shape. So how do we need to round this? Three. Three sig figs. Very good. That's it. Any questions? So I want to take a look at the problems that are due um, to kind of show you 